Economy Magazine at I-24 News, where we give you a daily view on world markets and global innovation. I'm Natalie Ehrlich. On today's program, a rival to the World Bank takes shape in China, and a focus on Israeli mapping startups. We'll start now with the headlines. A lot of twists and turns in the Greek debt story. The European Commission chief made a last-ditch effort to convince Greece's prime minister to accept Europe's bailout conditions. But early in the day, Greek government sources said the premier stood by his rejection. However, by the mid-afternoon, new reports suggested the Greek PM was considering to seek a last-minute deal with their creditors. Market watchers largely expected to see Greece default on a crucial payment to the IMF on Tuesday. Meanwhile, thousands of Greeks took to the streets of Athens protesting against austerity. With all the roller coaster events there, Greece seems likely to remain a wild card for some time. Well, now for further insight on the ground in Athens, we are joined by Anna, a Greek citizen. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, allowing me to participate and uh, express myself. Well, what is the mood there on the streets right now? Uh, things are in tension, okay? People stand a bit of frozen, trying to catch up with uh, all the news from domestic and foreign media uh, that uh, are changing from minute to minute. Uh, so, of course, there is anxiety. Uh, friends from abroad ask us about the situation in the country. Okay, the banks being closed and capital control have, uh, of course, attributed to that. Uh, but uh, still, there hasn't been panic or severe incidents outside banks. Um, there is some traffic in the supermarkets, though, that can be observed. But I think uh, people still are calm and patient. All right. Okay, well, thank you very much for that insight. We do appreciate it. Do Things are actually calmer than perhaps the headlines are reading right now. We will now move closer to home. The Israeli government unveiled its plan for the country's natural gas sector, a hotly contested debate here within Israel. The government effectively leaves the largest offshore project in the hands of a U.S.-Israeli consortium, though it still opens the door to new competition. Under the proposed outline, Texas-based Noble Energy and Israel's Delic Group will keep control of Leviathan, the largest of the gas fields found off Israel's coast. As for Delic, it will have six years to sell its entire stake in the second large offshore field known as Tamar. Noble will have to cut its share, though, in Tamar from 36 percent to 26 percent. And both companies will be forced to sell two smaller fields known as Tanin and Karish. Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff touted investment opportunities in Brazilian infrastructure in New York on Monday. Now, this is part of the country's new $64.1 billion plan to jumpstart economic growth through infrastructure projects, roads, railways, ports, and airports. According to several forecasts, Brazil's economy could contract more than 1 percent this year. These new projects will reportedly start no later than 2018 and are also aimed at improving Brazilian productivity. Rousseff also held various private meetings in New York with U.S. business leaders. Among them are former U.S. Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner, who now works for private equity firm Warburg Pincus. In all, we estimated 198.4 billion rials, which is around $65 billion in new investments during this concession period. Of this total, almost 70 billion will be used until 2018. The rest is for processes that will take more time to mature. Asian stocks largely ignored the Greek crisis on Tuesday, recovering from their losses just the day before. China's Shanghai Composite finished up 5.55 percent after plunging nearly 5 percent to hit an intraday low of 3,847 just earlier in the day. Japan's Nikkei gained back some of the previous 2.9 percent slump. As for South Korea, its Cosby index moved up just a day after finishing at a one-week low. Australian shares also ended up after a rocky trading day. And Microsoft said on Monday that it will now hand over its display advertising business to AOL and sell some map-generating software to Uber. The move is part of its efforts to slim down its money-losing online units. Now, the tech giant is likely to focus on its search engine business instead. Microsoft added that it wasn't planning any layoffs and employees would be given the chance now to move over to AOL. Uber, which is currently disrupting the taxi services market, is also said to be offering jobs to the some 100 employees in Microsoft's mapping division. Well, 
in other news, a rival to the World Bank is taking shape in China, giving the Asian juggernaut a 30 percent stake in this new institution. Fifty countries signed on. However, the U.S. and Japan staunchly oppose the bank's formation. Daniel Roth has this story. Early this week in Beijing, 50 countries from five continents signed articles of agreement for the China-led Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. China will have over 30 percent stake in the AIIB and hold just over 26 percent of the voting rights in the international financial institution. India is the second largest shareholder at 8.4 percent. Member countries in Asia will have 75 percent of the vote in the institution, bringing influence closer to home for China and making this a major foreign policy success for Beijing. The signing ceremony today is a step of historic significance towards the establishment of the bank. And we are happy to see what we have achieved so far. There is debate about whether the institution will serve as an extension for China's interests, but China's vote, while allowing some blocks on supermajority decisions such as deciding the bank's president, is not enough to veto most things. As well, it is notable that the decision-making setup gives smaller economies a larger voice, according to the Reuters report. The bank is widely viewed as a competitor for the Western-led World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. Though the U.S. has stood in opposition to its creation along with Japan, a number of European and Asian allies have signed on, including Britain and South Korea. The AIB is concentrated on the infrastructure, try to uh, improve the, for example, building up a water dam, uh, build up a high-speed train, etc. And then that, that can increase the capacity of, for those countries and then to enhance the future economic growth. As seven countries, including Denmark, Kuwait and South Africa, await domestic support for signing on, the AIIB further solidifies China as a global power. Still, the U.S. dollar is the currency of choice and English will be the language language used at the bank. For an update on emerging technology startups in Israel, we are joined in studio by Noah Rohn, economic correspondent at Channel 2. Well, thank you for being with us today. What do you have? Thank you. All right. So today I want to talk to you about maps. You know, map, a map is not a piece of paper anymore. It's way more than that. And it's also not just to look for a place that you've been looking for in your city or in your street. Um, actually, a map is becoming a community now. Uh, so first of all, I want to tell you about MapMe. It's like in Facebook? New Yes, something like that. So what MapMe is trying to create, is they're turning the, you know, the Facebook groups into maps. So they're turning maps into communities. You can actually create an interactive map if you have a community and let people talk about things through that map. So for example, if you have a community of foodies and you want, you want to create a map of the best restaurants in Tel Aviv, for example, you can create that map. And later on, with MapMe, you'll be able to discuss these restaurants, uh, recommend them, rate them, even you know get a table if you want through that map, just through the map, do everything that you need. Um, so these guys, actually, the guy that runs it, one of the founders is Ben Lang. He is the guy that started, he's only 21, by the way, and he started uh, Mapped in Israel, which is the Israeli map of startups. Uh, and they have already connected with really interesting interesting groups for example Israeli map to New York which is the Israeli startup map in New York um, also LGBT impact in London uh, that's another group that they um, have contacted and they're trying to create these communities through these maps so I, I want to make this clear you have this you have Google Maps you have Yelp it's kind of the same thing except map me is allowing you to add things to the map. I mean, it allows everybody to add anything they want to the map. So you can go to MapMe, search for the community that, that you know you have connection, a connection to, and then add your own place, add your own, your own business. So everybody can add anything that they like, and that's the difference between, between that and Yelp. Um, and the so, next story that you have? Yes. Yeah, so the second thing is that's also a map that's called Pet Nuts. Um, it's an Israeli startup that is creating a map, a community for pet owners. Uh, so it's, again, it's similar. It's for the community of pet owners. Um, it started by Udi, who was uh, an Israeli guy who just needed help with his pet. He needed a vet and he just called his vet. So he said, you know what? I need a community. I, can, I need a community to support me. So Pet Nuts allows you to uh, post uh, pictures pictures of your dog, videos, messages, and basically connect with the community of other pet owners in the area. Um, and then you can also search for suppliers, for um, training, dog walkers, whatever you need for your pet, all in one place. And 
of course, this is where the business comes from because you know suppliers can advertise through that uh, through that same app. But it also creates a community, uh, and they're only starting in um, Tel Aviv now. I mean, in Israel in general now, mostly in Tel Aviv, and it's really small now. But the potential is is huge because there are about uh, 550 million households in the world that own pets. So well, they're going to people gonna, all over yeah. the world do love pets. Thank you so much for your insight. We do appreciate it here as always. We will move on now to the rest of our global coverage in Nigeria. The search is on for better ways of dealing with the power cuts from the National Electric Company. Here's the story. Power cuts darken every aspect of Nigerians' lives. The country produces just over 1 percent of the electricity it needs. But in this Lagos suburb, things are about to improve. Bodhi Adun is a banker who set up a charity that installs street lamps in Oshodi, a neighborhood that's often plunged into darkness. If we have light at night, like all over the world, we have night market. It's going to enhance the economical aspect, the social aspect. If we have light at night, people will be able to will be free to go around the community. Newly appointed President Mohamedou Buhari has put the electricity problem as a priority on his four-year term. While Nigeria is one of the leading oil producers in Africa, gas is in short supply. And part of the problem is that most plants are powered by gas. If we continue along the line of a gas-powered plant, we may experience or we may continue to experience a, a regular lockdown of the country from time to time. So with a renewable energy, I think it will offer us a that uh, opportunities to really try something new. Most Nigerians are fed up with waiting for the state to resolve the problem. Many rely on generators which use a lot of fuel, which is why projects like Edunes are so important. We can move freely at night, to walk at night easily. So, and we can see ourselves, see people coming from far away. Nigeria's new president is in talks with the United States to implement a privatization plan that would increase power supply. But it might not be the best option. Privatization two years ago led to corruption and strikes. With more than half of the Nigerian population lacking access to electricity, no solution will be easy. Now for the stories we didn't want you to miss. We're joined on set by Daniel Roth. So what did you pull up for us today? Uh, first story is coming from Europe. Uh, it's a story from the Netherlands. Utrecht uh, is a city that's going to experiment at the end of this summer with a universal basic income. Uh, so this is something that's been popping up all over the news in the last four or five years. It's been an idea for decades. But essentially, it says, look, we don't need any more that people uh, work 40-hour weeks or 80-hour weeks or whatever it is. What we need is societies where people are free to create and to relax and work where they need to work and work when they need to work, but essentially to decouple wealth from labor so that everyone, by virtue of being a citizen, will have the minimal amount of uh, goods and services they need. So you'll have a home, you'll have a little bit of spending money, you'll be able to eat and all of these things. And uh, they're about to really experiment with this. Switzerland famously voted uh, uh, not so long ago not to do this nationally, they, but it was a big deal. It was a huge referendum. They came very close to actually enacting universal basic income well, on a national level. Doesn't sound like a utopian idea that never quite worked? Well, it's, it's a question. This is why they're experimenting first. Now, one of the things to note is people always talk about fraud, welfare fraud. People will steal from each other if it's all free. Actually, they found that welfare fraud is about 1.5 percent of the time. And where did they find this? Uh, that was in the Netherlands, actually, in their society, that they're finding there's a minimal amount of fraud. It's something that, of course, you have to take care of in any society. Uh, the and question perhaps is, perhaps it's all also is uh, culture specific. Perhaps these kind of experiments wouldn't work in other parts of the world. It's uh, it's absolutely culture specific. It depends on how how people relate to one another and what kind of uh, the pushes for actually. Uh, 
it's a it's an interesting question. You know, in North America, we're seeing a lot of smaller communal experiments happen. And the second story we have is from Toronto, uh, where I'm from, actually, uh, a story about someone's experience in building a sort of commune. Now, not a classic commune where a group of people get together from all different walks of life, but a, a family commune, a commune with in-laws. And uh, it's really a story about the beauty and the tragedy of that and kind of the challenges behind it and and uh, actually what are the what are the real benefits of it that life is actually cheaper when you live in a commune uh, you can access more things and live more for your dreams when you're in a commune but it's really really hard on but relationships less privacy though less privacy indeed and that's one of the things that's really really hard on relationships and something that really was interesting here these guys weren't hippies these were working professionals just trying to uh, squeeze their dollars a little bit further and make it by absolutely and so it's really on every level it's a really interesting well way thank to you live. very much for bringing up these stories we do appreciate here as always daniel roth that wraps up our show today do stay tuned tomorrow for all the latest in global business and innovation from the joff port in tel aviv i'm natalie ehrlich thank you for watching